Hello, this is the Daily Tech, and today I'm sharing some more tech news with you that is definitely quite interesting, so do stay uh, to listen for it, to it all. I definitely need to work on the intros before I begin, but anyway, here we are. So, firstly, you got to stop that video. Then secondly, I will talk about this. So, the Samsung Premiere projector uh, costs more than an 8K TV, which is definitely interesting. So... Uh, Samsung announced the pricing for its newly announced uh, Premiere 4K HDR Ultra Short Fro uh, projector. And um, if you don't have deep pockets, uh, you might be picking an 8K, which is still expensive in the stead. Uh, so, of course, this is a projector, not out of the common. I mean, it's a bit expensive for a projector, obviously, but <laughs> definitely see. So, the Samsung Premiere is coming in two models. Uh, so you have the 130-inch uh, Premiere LSP9T uh, that's dubbed the world's first HDR10 Plus projector and a slightly smaller 120-inch uh, uh, LSP7T. Uh, so one of them will set you back $6,499 uh, US dollars, which is around £5,070 £5, and the latter will be on sale for, so the uh, 130 inch will be on for that price, and the other one will be on sale for 3,499 uh, US dollars, which is £2,730. Definitely a different price for 10 different in, for 10 inches, but I guess it probably has a bit different, um, like, what do you call it, different uh, display technology, that would probably be it. So the irony here is that both of these versions are more expensive than the company's own 8K TV uh, that was released earlier this year. Uh, the Samsung uh, Q800T uh, that only comes in at a 3199 US dollar, uh, which is 3799 uh, British pounds, uh, with a 65-inch QN65 uh, Q800T. So of course you're not comparing um, apples to apples here, as I like to say. So obviously high-end projectors... Uh, always cost more than comparable flagship TVs, but obviously you're getting a much bigger display here as well. That is something to keep in mind. I mean, 130 inches is definitely different to um, what was it again? 60 inches, uh, 65 inches. But that doesn't change the fact for the fact you can get four uh, times the amount of pixels and a higher brightness in an 8K TV. Uh, but then again, who who's actually using 8K right now? Most most content doesn't use 8K. Most things don't use 8K, and some people really want a big projector, but it's still very expensive. Most people won't get this. Uh, so of course, it still has HDR10 Plus certified projector and delivers a peak brightness up to 2,800 NIS uh, a n s i lumens. Uh, so one of the first projectors to support filmmaker mode comes equipped with Samsung's smart TV platform that enables you to stream content from Netflix, Hulu, and other streaming platforms. Uh, but also it uses uh, Premiere. Uh, the Premiere uses acoustic beam technology to reduce better sound than any TV uh, built-in speaker possibly could. And if you don't like a TV taken over your living room, it's packed into a pretty compact box that looks quite nice actually. Of course, while you're getting, is so it definitely? Uh, isn't for most people obviously for the price mainly but I mean for the some people who can afford it this is actually a decent option um, assuming that it does look all right and it doesn't have to be too dark for it to work uh, it should be fine obviously other bones of TVs I just assume they're easier to see but then again that might just be uh, this projector probably is fine in bright environments uh, as possible but yeah that's something uh, really cool very expensive um, projector definitely probably one of the most expensive obviously not one of the most expensive but one of the most like consumer expensive kind of things so there's always going to be like you could say the most expensive smartphones as an it's more expensive one that isn't available to consumer kind of thing and it's the same with this but this is still very expensive uh huawei um is ready to reveal inner working to show no security threat uh, so obviously Huawei going through this big thing right now, where obviously they've been banned from things like Google, um, like, so Play Store, Google Play Services, Google Services, things like that. Um, obviously they're going to be they're using their own app gallery as an app store, and obviously they're also using um, what do you say? So they're also going to be switching to their own OS soon. Uh, so China's Huawei is ready to be thoroughly examined to show that its technology does not pose any risk to
to the countries that will include its equipment in the creation of 5G networks. Obviously, this will put them uh, quite bad in business-wise. Uh, said the head of its Italian unit uh, on Wednesday. Uh, so someone said, we will open our insides. Uh, we are available to be uh, vivisected and respond to all of the political pressure. Uh, President Luigi D. Uh, Vicis, uh, Vicis, um something like that, probably said that wrong, uh, said in an opening ceremony at the group Cybersecurity Center in Rome. Uh, the comments came on the same day uh, that U.S. Secretary of State Mike uh, Pompeo uh, began a two-day visit to Italy. So, of course, the United States has lobbied Italy and other European uh, allies to avoid using Huawei equipment in their next-generation networks because uh, it could pose a security risk. Uh, risk. Obviously, Huawei has rejected these, and they said they're willing to fully open up to show that they're not doing anything uh, that would pose security risks. Obviously, it's going to put them out of a lot of business. That's a lot of places that they would not be able to use. Obviously, I mean, for the fact they're willing to do this, definitely shows something. Like, they're definitely going to cause them issues if they can't. And obviously, um, I think it's good as well that they're willing to do this. It kind of shows that they might not be doing anything. I mean, we really have no way of confirming that yet, but obviously it's possible. Uh, okay, so... What else did he say? So someone else said, I don't know who said it, except just he said, probably the US. Anyway, um, I'm speechless that a country the size of the United States attacks another country through the demolition uh, via groundless accusations of a company of that country, which is a true point. Obviously, um, Huawei are only a company that came from China. Imagine if you were blocking uh, US uh, companies from China just for the fact that they don't want Chinese data going to uh, US. It just doesn't really work. Uh, Duvetius said that uh, despite all pressure, Huawei had no intention of leaving the Italian market and was considering adding further products in the field such as energy. Uh, but it's extremely unlikely Huawei will leave the market because of the current situation. Obviously it's not great for them, but hopefully uh, maybe they will get uh, checks and it will be fine for them and they'll be going back to normal slightly. But obviously this is obviously a bit annoying for them. Obviously, for the amount that's happening. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it does sort out them. I don't believe that they'll be doing anything, but I mean, I have no evidence for either cases. And obviously, um, could be anything. But I mean, I think most people would believe that they aren't doing anything. And I think that's definitely, I don't think they're trying to do anything. I think as a company like them, they wouldn't want to, It as it has hurt them. But obviously, I think it definitely uh, needs to be checked. Uh, Bethesda founder comments Microsoft's buyout in battle against Sony. Uh, so of course I don't believe the founder works there anymore. It might do actually. Oh dear, yeah, so he left the company in 2002, which was like 18 years ago. So definitely a while ago. But uh, they have commented on this. Uh, so Christopher Weaver has kept an eye on his former company. As you probably would. I mean, if you've owned a company, you might actually, um, you might actually still keep on looking at it. I mean... Not many people would know. Anyway, about Microsoft's uh, ZeniMax Media buyout. Uh, we've already said that Microsoft's tactics of buying studios uh, simply so Sony can't have them is a brilliant counter move against the PlayStation producer. Uh, so the interview brings up Microsoft's history of picking up development studios like uh, Bungie in an effort to continue providing its customers with new, exclusive content that PlayStation fans are sure to go Xbox screen uh, with envy over. I absolutely love that phrase, though. Uh, obviously, um, with buying those companies, they can stop them from selling to Sony and their games, uh, which obviously means that Xbox would have exclusives, which means obviously uh, the more people would buy it, as obviously, I'm saying obviously way too much, uh, as because um, obviously, oh, for goodness sake, I need to really stop saying um, obvious. Oh, right, okay, I'm just going to... So they don't want... They won't be able to use um, on PlayStation, which obviously. Oh, right, okay, I give up happily. Right, so they won't be able to. PlayStation owners won't be able to use it on Xbox. I don't know why that was so hard. Uh, but all is not lost for Sony, as Weaver rightly brings up, even with its acquisition studios, uh, gay, creating games that, that need to do well business, uh, need to do well for the business to pay off. So they said, uh, at the end of the day, a product can only be good as good as the creatives who make it, uh, says Weaver. And of course he's right, as long as Microsoft gives Bethesda and ZeniMax the room they need to continue making these really good titles, then this should absolutely work in their favour. 
But of course, if the games get worse because of this, then we see it won't matter so much and it will be really disappointing for parties. Uh, Weaver also does go on to mention that he thinks Microsoft's timing was carefully planned. Uh, so he, do, he comments that he does not think it's an accident uh, that this announced occurred so close to the PS5 announcement. And there are only a limited number of premium creators of AAA. And of course what Microsoft owns, Microsoft can't get. So of course if Microsoft own uh, these companies, they can stop them selling their games to Sony. Well not selling them, but like selling it on there, which gives them Xbox exclusives. I do believe PlayStation actually do get like deals to do this instead of buying the companies, so that's definitely interesting. But I guess it works, and I mean then they'll have all the game development stuff as well. I think it could definitely work well. I think it's also kind of good for the uh, game developers as well, where they'll be able to have more access to it probably, uh, and it'll definitely be easier for them. Uh, so just so that's quite good. Uh, so now the thing from laptop. I mean, is it actually it's just like laptop magazine or something like that? Think about it. This looks way too much like tech radar. Like, I mean, that's just it. Probably either one's based on either one. It's probably like a really big thing, and they're just building off this similar uh, thing. But still, I mean, I use Tech Radar too much to the point where that's kind of what it is. I mean, look at it, it's pretty much identical. Anyway, so Surface Laptop Go uh, could be Microsoft's newest laptop, and it may launch this week. Uh, so Sparty has been the unofficial label given to the rumored 12.5-inch affordable laptop, and allegedly become a new member of the Microsoft Surface family. Uh, so thanks to the new one, we now know that Microsoft's official name for the Sparty uh, could be Laptop Go, which would make sense if there's a smaller laptop. Uh, hopefully it's a bit cheaper as well, as they do go on to say. So obviously the Microsoft Surface Laptop Go, along with other uh, Surface X, uh, Pro X2, uh, running on an updated Microsoft SQ2 processor, may launch as early as this week, which is really good. Uh, so the Surface Go Laptop, uh, the Surface Laptop Go, uh, is Microsoft's. Um, it's rumored to be a mid-range PC. Uh, to remember, on base giant tech uh, could be launching soon. It should have a 12.5 inch display that will reportedly uh, support a smaller digital footprint compared to other um, laptops in the Surface family. And of course, people like these small laptops. I mean, had like, I compare MacBooks way too much, but anyway, we're going to go after that anyway because I think it's a suitable one. If the MacBook 12 inch hadn't had all the problems that I think we all know about, um, obviously, then that probably would have been uh, quite popular. And I think that's what Microsoft are trying to get at as well. Uh, people like smaller laptops, especially for the portability. Like, if you need a portable laptop, not powerful necessarily, but powerful enough to run things. Um, and obviously, it's obvious. Uh, so, obvi right, okay, if I say obviously one more time. Right, anyway, so of course, they won't be able, it will be more popular and just popular to begin. Like, people will like it more because it's that smaller footprint, they'll be able to do things, smaller footprint, portable. Uh, very, it will be portable. So, uh, as they mentioned last week, the same way Microsoft Surface Go is positioned as a budget-friendly Surface Pro. Uh, the Microsoft Laptop Go will be marketed as an affordable Surface Laptop, so they'll advertise the affordability. This is a new affordable laptop kind of thing. Looking at this spec sheet though, it's a bit interesting. Uh, so the entry level uh, Microsoft Surface Laptop Go will allegedly ship with a 10th gen uh, Core i5, which is a 1035G1 CPU. Uh, 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage. Uh, the 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage is definitely interesting. Uh, so 4 gigs of RAM I can kind of get behind, but I would have thought they might have tried to get 8 gigs. It's just something I'm thinking about. I think 8 gigs is probably more suitable, but I guess probably wouldn't matter. You're not doing too much multitasking on these. But 64 gigabytes of storage, that's where I'm a bit skeptical. Obviously, um, it won't be... Oh, I just said it again. Oh, well. Anyway, so... 64 gigs isn't exactly lots of storage. I mean, seven games take up that. Of course, you're not playing games. It's just a good comparison. Like, if you're downloading a lot uh, to do stuff like, um, I don't know, what would be a good one? You're not really video editing on this machine or anything like that. I don't know. That's, that's something you'll do that download a decent bit. Or you're just using it, and you need to keep everything downloaded. And obviously, 64 gigs isn't great. I mean, there will be higher storage capacities, I assume, but still. Uh, Nguyen uh, also revealed that the storage configurations may come with flash memory cards instead of FSDs, uh, which is definitely interesting as well. I mean, if you can switch these memory cards to higher ones, then 
think it's not too bad. But I mean, it would have been nice to have an SSD, but I guess it's more affordable for them. Uh, so the entry-level Laptop Go could run Windows 10 Home in S mode, uh, while the higher price iterations may offer Windows 10 Pro. Uh, the affordable 12.5-inch laptop is also rumoured to support Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5, which is nice. I mean, most laptops and phones, things like that, do. Uh, the new ones, anyway. So, for the release date, uh, probably October the 1st, which is tomorrow, I assume, unless there's 31 days in September, in which I don't think there is. But, I mean, I'm awful at how many days are on the month, so probably is. Uh, I don't think it is. So. Anyway, so, 1st of October, probably tomorrow. Um, of course, until Microsoft officially announces Sparty, we can't say for sure if these rumours are true, as I probably should say more often when I talk about these rumours. Obviously, uh, taking off a pinch of salt, these are rumours. They're not true, necessarily. I mean, you have some rumours where, like, or not rumours, but you have some things like the Oculus Quest 2 video leak, where you can confirm that's a real thing there. But, I mean, you've got these rumours that are basically basing off kind of just things where we haven't got great evidence to if they're real or not. That's something you should keep in mind. Uh, yeah, so just obviously keep that in mind. Uh, LG Wing 5G price revealed. Uh, this swivel screen phone costs as much as an iPhone 11 Pro. Which I don't actually know the price of, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, so, of course, uh, Tech Creator, which is where this article is from, uh, got their hands on the LG Wing earlier in the month. And, of course, they were able to get a look at this uh, new, uh, interestingly designed phone. And, of course, this kind of new innovation tends to translate into a kind of very high flagship price, even if it's kind of got what, the great... Even if it's got maybe a lower processor, which I think we can agree would be decent for this phone anyway. Uh, so the Ryzen version of the LG Wing, which will be available for a pre-order for US buyers on October the 1st, which is again tomorrow, uh, for $999, uh, US dollars, which is around $770 uh, British pounds and uh, $1,400 Australian dollars. And will arrive in homes uh, 15 days later on October the 15th. Or is that 14 days later? One of the two. Anyway, uh, that $1,000 price tag leaked in August, but had previously been estimated in the $1,600 uh, range, which was definitely wrong. But making today's confirm a relief for uh, people who do want this phone, maybe have a decent bit of money, uh, but do want this phone. Anyway, there's no word uh, for yet of the, when the AT&T and T-Mobile versions of the phones will ship, uh, though they are expected to fall uh, later this year uh, in fall, uh, or maybe quarter three. Uh, the Verizon uh, version runs on the company's millimeter wave tech. It is unclear if this required any special uh, augmentation, or if the alternate variants could be cheaper as a result. But I think we're assuming an identical price. Obviously, um, just go over the basics of the phone. Uh, the LG Wing supports a 6.8 inch OLED screen and a second 3.9 inch mini display when you uh, twist it. As my great uh, title said, like two weeks ago probably it was um yeah lg made a phone that twists anyway um uh, it has eight gigs of ram 4000 million power battery uh, supports three rear cameras 64 megapixel main 12 megapixel ultra wide and a 30 megapixel ultra wide okay well apparently those are both similar anyway so uh, lg also sells a more traditional multi-screen phone uh, with the lg v60 thin q and dual screen accessory but I think this phone uh, definitely has some potentials uh, with stuff. So obviously, um, it does depend what you're doing, because if you're doing things that are just like general phone tasks, but I mean, if you're doing stuff that can be multitask, I mean, the gimbal mode, I feel like for some people this could be alright. I mean, even kind of vlog, it's just a really bad description, not many people are, but I mean, I want to go with it anyway, because it's a good uh, description. So obviously, if you're vlogging, you can flip it, hold the, hold the bottom screen as the bottom screen, have it facing you, and it's... Alright camera as well, I don't know what the selfie camera is, but I assume it's actually alright, so it's definitely possible. Uh, so, yeah. Alright, for the next one, uh, New Vive Cosmos bundle will likely encourage you to buy an Oculus Quest 2 instead, which is definitely not what they were aiming for. I mean, I don't know if I made that clear or anything, but I mean, you don't tend to make your deals want people go with an Oculus Quest 2, I mean, or any other kind of product. I mean, it kind of doesn't work in your favour. Uh, so HTC Vive announced its Cosmos Series X Aurorus 15G bundle. Uh, it's available to buy in the UK and Germany. Uh, seeing the Vive Cosmos virtual reality headset packaged up in a Gigabyte Aurorus 15 gaming laptop uh, with that. Uh, so unlike the recent Oculus Quest 2, the Vive Cosmos requires the use of a gaming system 
uh, so a PC to function gaming computer. Uh, and so it's bundling Gigabyte's gaming laptop uh, makes a lot of sense. However, with a whopping £2,549, which is kind of crazy, uh, the bundle is unlikely to be a mainstream hit. I mean, that's kind of obvious. The Oculus Quest 2 can function independently for £299. Obviously, you're not getting the full VR. I mean, you're getting a full VR experience, but I mean, you're not getting, um, obviously, all the highest end graphics and all the games that you can get. But you're still getting most of the VR experience, and uh, you can still connect it to a decent PC. I mean, a £500 PC. Uh, can run VR. I mean, it's not the best VR experience, and it can, it will still lag. You probably need to go from like a 700, to be honest. But still, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, so the Gigabyte Aurora 15 GWD gaming laptop uh, features an Intel Core i7 uh, 10875H uh, uh, processor and an NVIDIA RTX 2070 Max Q GPU. Uh, so it typically costs one thousand nine hundred ninety nine. So it is currently on offer on Amazon. And when purchased individ uh, independently, uh, meanwhile the Vive Cosmos currently retails for £699, uh, so it's not even that good of a good deal. I mean, you're only getting £149. I mean, I don't know why you would want it. I don't know, gaming laptops I don't really agree with most of the time. Some people you have to, some people need gaming laptops, but I think for most people, um, you can get a similar spec to PC for somewhere in the 1000 range, and it's definitely... I mean, maybe a bit more, a bit less kind of thing, but it's still. Also, the Vive Cosmos isn't even a great... I mean, it's a good VR headset, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, for that price point, it's not exactly great. I mean, you got you could get an Oculus Quest 2 where you could use it individually, and then, I mean, you can get this whole thing uh, with the um, laptop and an Oculus Quest 2, uh, where you can plug that into the Oculus... I mean, you can get the... Uh, I think you can still get uh, the VR ca the, um, cable, the Oculus Link cable, for still uh, un under that price. Uh, which is crazy, and obviously you're getting a decent uh, VR headset that can do its own thing as well. Like you can unplug it, and maybe if you're traveling, you can use that. I mean, if you, I guess you have a gaming laptop, but still. Of course, also, uh, running VR from a gaming laptop will likely uh, deplete the battery at a rapid rate, so you won't get um, hours of fun like from uh, when it's just plugged in like a normal computer. Uh, also, a Vive Point Infinity subscription is included, which allows you access to numerous applications and games, uh, but don't expect things like Half-Life Alex and things like that to be included, because they'll have to be purchased separately. And it's great to see the likes of Vive and Gigabyte teaming up for an all-in-one VR bundle, uh, but we're unconvinced this particular bundle is even that good. I mean, we would love to see something like maybe a Vive and something like a normal computer, stuff like that, or like you. I don't know, there's definitely other bundles they could do, it would be more appealing. Also, I don't think the Cosmos really is that popular, like... Forza is, I mean, you could get something like, I hate saying this with VR headsets, but like he used uh, Vive, which are generally better. I mean, this is an all-in-one, which was meant to compete with the Rift S, I believe. But I mean, it was more expensive, and it's not even the greatest thing. I mean, I guess you had those built-in headphones, which, I mean, it looks really cool, to be fair, though. So, I guess that makes up for everything. Oh, I'm joking, by the way. Anyway, so a foldable HTC uh, phone might be in the works as well, uh, based on a new pattern. Everyone seems to be making foldable phones, I'm going to be honest. I mean, they're kind of becoming what every company is making. I mean, when we first saw that first foldable phone, probably, what was it, like the Pi Flex at CES 2018, 2019? One of those. And it was so cool. The thought of the phone folding is just still mind-bending right now. I mean, it's not too bad thinking about it now. But, I mean, still. Uh, so, obviously, now every company seems to be doing it, and it's not so... Of course, even though uh, foldable phones are still in, aren't still mainstream, but I think they will be one. I think foldable phones are the future. I mean, I don't know what type. Maybe the ones that kind of uh, the uh, razor, uh, Motorola razor, or um, like a what is it called, the Samsung uh, fold. I mean, do you want a tablet and a phone baked in, or just want a phone? It's weird. Uh, so we've not heard much from HTC in terms of new smartphones in recent years. I mean, I don't think their smartphones are ever too popular, but still decent, though. I mean, my first phone was a HTC. I think it was, like, the 1... No, the 626. It was one of those. Anyway, so it had, like, 626 in the name, I believe. Anyway, so uh, for the new Taiwanese company, could be making a dramatic return to the market with a new foldable phone, according to a newly discovered person. Uh, so as spotted by Let's Go Digital, the filing shows a mobile device that 
uh, it's very definitely uh, has a hinge in the middle which obviously indicates a folding phone uh, if display apparently folding outwards so it's still visible in two halves uh, when the phone's closed we can't really work out much from the pattern but it does show that it could be working on a uh, thing similar to the Motorola Razr which would be uh, quite good and I think it could get them some sales depending on how they price this product obviously they're going to do really really high prices and people won't get it but I think if they do this right HT, this is HTC uh, phone could become quite popular uh, so the display would adapt as the device is folded uh, which is explained in the pattern uh, continuing to show information even when it was shut uh, that's as you would expect uh, nothing surprising uh, so HTC uh, changed its CEO around last time uh, around time last year and the new boss has gone on record as saying he wants to make the company's smartphone division profitable again obviously their phones weren't too popular uh, perhaps a folding phone is a sort of premium gadget that might help uh, so if we don't see a, if we do see a foldable phone from HTC in the next year or two uh, then obviously it could be decent uh, of course in if it's a year or two it Foldable phones could get a lot more cheaper. Oh wait, so this folds set of screens on the outside. Ooh. Does it? I don't know, maybe it doesn't. It might do both ways to be fair. I mean, that's possible. Don't think so. Anyway, that's a bit weird. I mean, I feel like folding inwards could be better. Anyway, so, of course, it'll have plenty of competition. I mean, in two years as well. Um, we've already seen second series of things. Uh, so definitely a bit late into it, well not late into the market to be fair, but definitely they need to do well. That's just something to keep in mind. Right, and finally, uh, more foldable phone news. Uh, the revamped Motorola Razr foldable launches on October the 2nd, starting at the very cheap 1200 US dollars. I mean, that's most very cheap. Obviously, I am joking. Uh, so... <laughs> I mean, I would be a bit scared if you didn't think I was joking. Anyway, so, uh, photo phones have had uh, quite a journey, of course, with the first, like, uh, Samsung Galaxy Fold having all those issues, and I think that really actually didn't help the foldable phone whatsoever. And, of course, most of others hoping for similar luck with the new revamped version of the Razer. Uh, they want to be things like the Galaxy Fold, Galaxy, uh, Galaxy uh, Flip, things like that. So, the Lenovo-owned brand announced this morning uh, the latest edition of the phone will officially uh, launch in North America on October the 2nd and for a limited time uh, will be available from select retailers including Amazon, Best Buy, B&H and its own site uh, for $1,200 US dollars and of course that's one $200 US dollar initial discount for early adopters uh, with faith that Motorola nailed it this time. Uh, the original version of the handset launched last year uh, had everything working in its favour, from an iconic name to the latest in smartphone devices. Ultimately, it ran into poor reviews, keeping with the theme of initial wave of foldables. Uh, it was a big letdown uh, for a legitimately exciting device. Uh, so obviously, hopefully they'll come back with more power. Short one there, but of course, uh, interesting all the same. Very expensive, I mean, we talk about a lot of expensive stuff um, this episode. Anyways... Uh, I hope you did enjoy this episode though, I mean, it would be very good if you did. If you did, do leave a like if you're on YouTube and subscribe and turn on bell notifications. Uh, this is so you can see all the latest tech news by me. Obviously you will, it's daily and very entertaining as I'm sure. It probably isn't, but anyway, um, and if you're on things like Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, Pocket Casts, I don't know if anyone actually uses that. Uh, so then uh, do uh, click, there should be like a follow button, heart button, something like that. Do you click that, and again, this is just see see all the latest tech news. Anyways, have a good day.